Hi, I'm Chip Ingram, and welcome to Living on the Edge. We're in the middle of a brand new series called Five Lies That Ruin Relationships. In our last session last week, we talked about a lie that we believe that is so subtle that it's about our work, about our job, about our careers. And now we're going to talk about the truth. How do you make great decisions about your job, your work, your career? You know, about 60 to 80 percent of your waking hours, you're not sleeping, you're not eating, and you're not at home. You're at work. And God wants you to make great decisions about your work. We learned there is a lie that the belief that unconsciously any upward mobility opportunity is always His will is planning apart from Him and could be devastating. So join me now as we learn how to make great decisions according to God's Word. If life is uncertain, if life is short, how should you go about making wise decisions with regard to work? And then in the next few verses, verses 15 to 17, he's going to give us a clear explanation. Follow along as I read, how do we make good decisions about our work? He says, okay, in contrast, instead, literally the word is anti. You know, instead or anti over against what you just heard, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. As it is, you boast and you brag, and all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good, circle the phrase the good, because we'll come back to it. If anyone knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, he sins. And the word good here means morally excellent, that which is praiseworthy, that which is winsome, that, that which does good things and great things in the lives and the hearts of other people. I think out of this brief three verses, God gives us four very clear axiomatic ways to make good decisions about work. He gave us the prescription, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will. He gave us the reproof, don't be boastful and arrogant about the future. And then he gave us the warning, if you know what's right to do, it's good, and don't do it, it's sin. And out of that passage, I see four clear principles. Number one, in making decisions about work, number one, make God's will the foundation for all decision making. Just, you know, who knows the future? God does. Who has your best interest in mind? God does. That's the part I think we don't believe. Would you jot in your notes Psalm 8411? This is like one of my most, I love this verse, verses. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God's for, he, you know what? He's not trying to keep you from a good job with lots of money and all the things you think you're going to deliver. The Lord God is a sun, unlimited resources. The Lord is a shield, your protector. The Lord gives grace. In other words, stuff you don't deserve. The Lord gives glory. He wants to expand and multiply and be good to you. He's your father. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. When you get that, then you say, Lord, you know, I think a lot of us are afraid to pray. We're going to say, Lord, do you want me to take this juicy, wonderful opportunity? And I'm afraid you're going to say no. So, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't have time to hear you. <laughs> because we think we know what's best for us. Who knows if things are going to stay the same? Who knows what's going to change? Who knows what's best for us? Who knows what transitions our daughter, our son, our wives are going to go through? Who knows that maybe if I'm single, maybe I'm leaving and God has someone in this place instead of that? I don't know, but God does. I came that you might have life, Jesus said, and have it abundantly. So make God's will. You know, you say, God, I want your will more than any of my desires. Second, I think under this is that uh, commit and say to yourself, regardless of the circumstances and the seeming can't miss opportunity, I am going to do whatever you say. There's got to be a commitment of the heart prior to the decision. Uh, I was doing a little research and found out that in the old days, on uh, believers would write letters to one another, and at the end of the letter, they would just put, in the olden days, D period, V period. Anybody know what that means? It's a Latin phrase. Deo valente. And they didn't mean it as a cliche. You know what it meant? It meant, if the Lord wills. See, they would write a letter, and they would talk about, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, or I hope to come and see you, and hope things are right then. DV, Deo Valente, if the Lord wills. In other words, it's with an open hand. I think that's making God's will the foundation. Now, let me give you, because I think this is important, some very specific ways, I think, to make God's will the foundation. 
of all your decision making. And I have here, and I don't know if I gave you room, one, two, three, four, and this is kind of like sort of the basics on finding the will of God underneath this section, but, but are you ready? Here's, here's, here's how, when I have to find the will of God, when I had to make the decision to leave California and move to Atlanta and take this new role with walkthrough, number one, I had to get to the point where I was willing. Be willing to do whatever God wants you to do. Underneath that, you might jot John 7, 17. Jesus said to a group of people, if any man is willing to do my will, he'll know of the teaching, whether it's of God or whether I speak from myself. I think almost 90% of the will of God is getting my heart to the point where instead of trying to read into verses or read into counsel, God, I will do, no matter what it is, I will do whatever you want me to do. The second way that, at least for me, to find God's will is to pray. Matthew 7, 7, seek and you'll find. Ask and you'll receive. Knock and it'll be open. Ask God, Lord, show me. Show me. Speak to me. The third is God's word. Psalm, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. So often for me, just I keep reading where I'm reading. God, you know it's a big decision. Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm willing to do whatever. I'm asking you. And as I'm reading, speak to me from your word. Uh, for me with walkthrough, I told God, I cannot go unless you give me a promise. I gotta have a promise. I gotta, I gotta have where you personalize a part of scripture that say, Chip, this is what I want you to do. Because I knew that if I left, I'd have days where I regretted and said, oh, this is the dumbest thing in my life. And if I stayed, I'd have regrets to say, oh, brother, God brought this in front of me and he wanted me to do it and I just didn't have the courage of the faith. So no matter which I did, I was gonna have regrets. And I figured either place, I'm gonna have a really bad, difficult day where circumstances are gonna be bad. I've gotta know, not based on circumstances, but from the Lord. And the only way I know to do that is a promise. And so he gave me a promise from uh, Acts 26 as I sat on the floor of, uh, of the airport for me. And I was been begging and I'd fasted and praying and did all the things you're supposed to do. And I heard God say, Chip, now get up, arise, and stand on your feet and go to where I send you. And I want you to be my witness and my servant to tell. And it's really in the context, it's, he was talking to Paul. But I think sometimes God will, you know, you know when you're reading the Bible and it's like it just glows and comes off the page and it's like, this is for you? Now, I'm not saying that happens all the time, but when I'm looking for the will of God, oh, God, give me a promise. So I'm going to be willing. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get into the scriptures. And number four, wise counsel. Wise counsel. He who dwells with wise men will be wise, but the companion of a fool will suffer harm. That's Proverbs 13, 20. So make, make God's will the foundation. And I think that's how you do it. I'm willing to do it. I'm asking. I'm in your word. And I'm going to ask the people who know me best and who really walk with God, what do you think of this opportunity? And I'm not going to do what they say. It's in the multitude of counselors, their safety. I'm going to weigh that. The second principle that flows out of this to make good decisions about work is recognize the root cause of planning apart from God. And that's in verse 16. As it is, you boast and you brag. Literally, you take pride in your arrogance. I like the Phillips translation. He says, you get a certain pride, as he translates this, in yourself in planning for the future with such confidence. And I think the key here is motive. It's in pronouncing our plans or our capabilities as a statement of faith. This is what I believe the Lord wants me to do. But actually, when you get good at stuff, I mean, when you know you're good, and by the way, it's okay to be good at stuff. God made you good at stuff. But that's where you can get tripped up. You're good at it, and you know, hey, I've done this. Look what happened. I've done this. Look what happened. I've done this. Look what happened. Here's another opportunity. I I'm just going to go do this, and I can tell you. I can tell you what's going to happen because I built that. I built that. I built that, and bang, you know. I was manager here, director here, supervisor here, VP here, and, and you just, it's kind of this, there's sort of a, you know, you know, I got it. And when that great next juicy opportunity is, there's something in the human heart. And so I, I think we just need to be open and sensitive to the Lord. God's will may be, that's the next step. God's will may be, this is a test. And you know, Jesus has, Jesus has these statements that are so hard to get around. It's either me or mammon. Remember that one? You can't worship it and me. And so often, upwardly mobile opportunities 
put us to the very test about what's the core value. I, I remember when Bill Carter said no to that job. I remember like coming home and talking to my wife and sort of telling the story and going, I can't believe that. It was so rare. It was so unusual. But really it was his spiritual priorities and relational priorities were higher than making more money. Why would I be shocked that a Christian thinks that way? <laughs> you know? Because I don't meet many Christians that think that way. If Henry would have thought that way, he would have an intact family. If Henry would have thought that way, his kids would be still flourishing. If Henry would have thought that way, he'd be living in his own nice little house in rural Texas, growing and changing and stopping the abuse and starting a new generation of people. And instead, he's living in a station wagon. Every upwardly mobile opportunity may not be God's will. And that's the third principle from this passage. Don't buy the lie. Upwardly mobile work opportunities are automatically the will of God. That's the lie. We just, we just think unconsciously. Often we don't even think. Upwardly mobile opportunity. This, this, this. It must be God's will. And I would say do not buy the lie. Doesn't mean you shouldn't take them. Doesn't mean not to pray about them. It doesn't mean that it's more spiritual to say no to those. The other test may be God is stretching you. God's given you capacity. And you were here and the director here and the manager here and the supervisor here and the VP here. And this is a new platform for ministry. But you go there not because of look at who I am and how much I've got and how much I'm going to make. You go there as a steward of the manifold grace of God. This is a big responsibility. This will mean major changes if you still have a family. Uh, I, before I go, I mean, Bill, you know what he did? He flew out. He visited a half a dozen churches. He said, I didn't sense that I would have uh, the kind of fellowship that I need for where I'm at in my life right now. It doesn't mean that you don't take upwardly mobile opportunities, but the lie is believing upwardly mobile opportunities are automatically slam dunk the will of God. And what James is saying is, they're not. The fourth principle that flows out of this passage in making wise decisions about work is to act on your God-given dreams and impulses. In verse 17, what's it say? If anyone knows what the good is, the blessing is, the beautiful thing, the praiseworthy, the morally positive thing to do, and knows that he ought to do it but doesn't do it, he sins. In verses 13 to 16, it's a sin of commission. It's arrogant planning apart from God. In verse 17, he warns us about the sin of omission. You know, what, there is a good that you ought to do. The good that you ought to do may be take care of these areas instead of the job. Or the good you ought to do may be, in, in my case, I didn't want to leave. Mine was a stewardship issue. Do I want to get to impact one local area or God do you want to take me out of what I love to do with people that I love to do it with my family where it's at and things intact and I don't want to go? And by the way, the weather is kind of nice in Santa Cruz. <laughs> and do you want me as a steward to take that same set of gifts out of my comfort zone and be able to help tens of thousands of pastors and millions of people around the world? And for me, it wasn't like, wow, I got this big promotion. For me, it was like, I want to do that. But... Him who knows the good, him who knows what he ought to do and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. I, I, to me, not taking that would have been an unwillingness to step out in faith and keep in my comfort zone. And so I would ask you, what is the good that God has prompted you to do? What is the good that you think he might be saying, hey, see this passage pushes real hard on don't buy the lie, upward mobility about your job. But then, not just with regard to the job, this is sort of a summary statement. This verse, I think, is summarizing where we've been in terms of the teaching of James. Is there anything in your life or anything in my life you say, this is the good I ought to do. I ought to teach that class. I ought to mentor that young woman. You know what? My lands, you know, I've had a great job, and he's talking about all this stuff, and I got a 401K and a 701K and a 1501K, and people have had all kind of problems, and, you know, in my honest, honest hearts of hearts, I'd have to live about four lifetimes to spend all the money. And I've hoarded my security. And I, I ought to, you know what, I ought to divest. And all the research I've done, I, I've worked with a group called Generous Giving. They've done research with people that are extraordinarily wealthy. And they can't give you one or two instances of leaving it to their children where it's worked out well. And they have zero instances where millions and millions of dollars have done anything but totally corrupt and ruin their grandchildren. 
and yet people have the stack of money. I remember one guy saying, well, I mean, this is how we all have that, that, little, that little line that says, well, I'm going to give over and above when I sort of, this is okay. And in probably years ago, when I have a million dollars and, you know, and I know, you know, and sort of net assets and things were in, I'll be okay. And then it got to be 10 million and then 100 million. And I actually had an encounter with someone who said, you know something, I feel real free to give generously, but it's kind of after you have 1 billion set aside. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, dude, how much steak can you eat in one day? I mean, you know? You know? And what I realized, what is the good that we ought to do? Is it, is it giving wildly and generously? Is it, is, it, is it saying that, you know, maybe some of us in, in those middle or more twilight years have more to offer, and instead of figuring out how to lower your golf score quite so well, that you invest your wisdom and your life and your gifts in the next generation? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's taking a risk. Maybe it's stepping out. What is the good? What's the dream in your heart that God maybe has been kind of saying, hmm, that you ought to do? And he says, you know what? This is an interesting definition of sin, isn't it? If you know what's right to do and don't do it, it's sin. And sin just means missing the mark. And why does God not want us to miss the mark? Because he's a sun and a shield. He gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold. His plans for us are great. Why, why is James reproving these entrepreneurs and business people from planning apart from God? It's because your plans and my plans and their plans apart from God will never land us in the best place. He's a loving God. I think somehow we get this idea that all of God's rules and all of his commandments, you know, he's kind of just trying to keep us from something good. His commandments are like the guardrails on a windy road where that if you go over the edge of the road, you drop a thousand feet and die. All those commands and all those guardrails, you know what they're for? They're to keep you on the road so that as you follow the road and get on the highway, you get the highest and the best. But what I will tell you is, in the world that we live in, you'll make a lot of tough decisions and you'll look very different than the average Christian when you make your plans, not apart from God, but surrendering them to God. And um, I would guess a little bit from your faces and just a little bit from experience is there are some people in this room that took some jobs years back and you look back now and, and literally in your mind as I've been talking, you thought, boy, I wonder why I took that. I didn't even think about whether to take that job or not. And then one of your kids went through a rough time or that was, let's see, you took the job. It was three years later. It's when your divorce hit. Uh, the company that looked so rock solid and you got the big promotion and then stock options went down. They hired a new CEO and they downsized. And some of you in this room can think back to a job decision you made that you just think, boy, I wish I would have heard this about five years ago or 10. And I think the danger is thinking there's no hope. The danger is thinking and I, I did. I took a job and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was selfish and greedy. I just kind of just did it, just made sense. And if you happen to be one of those people with lots of pain, I want to ask you just to jot down two little chapters and I want to tell you a story because I want you to know that you can blow it big time, make terrible decisions, and even make them <laughs> innocently. And our God is a God of grace, a God of hope, and a God of restoration. And jot down, if you would, just in the corner, Genesis chapter 12 and 13. And you maybe can get a Coke or a cup of coffee or tea or whatever you like and put your feet up and if you're in that situation and read it. And the story is very simple. There's a man who has a very important relationship with God and God calls him and he obeys him. And he obeys him, but there's an opportunity. See, you think about these kind of jobs and there's some difficulty and it wasn't like exactly a job, but the economic conditions caused him to make a decision to go down into Egypt. And then he got in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so then that causes us to compromise our integrity, and then he started telling some lies about his wife to protect his own skin. And then, if you know the story, uh, his wife ends up in Pharaoh's harem, and just before he becomes one more wife, God disciplines and saves Abraham's wife out of that situation and Pharaoh is pretty hot. 
And what you find is he, he leaves Egypt. And that, that's not a pretty time. In Abraham's life, he was a chicken, okay? He made a decision apart from God. His circumstances led him directly to economically try and handle what was happening instead of saying, God, you called me to this place. I don't know how you're going to provide for him, but I'm going to trust you. Instead, he took a decision economically based. Then he began a, a whole journey of lies that almost ended him up completely in the ditch. And it's really interesting that God is gracious to make him aware that it's a mistake. And maybe that's what he did for you in this room. And then in the end of uh, chapter 13, as he moves out in the beginning of chapter 14, you find him in a new land, and God sets out some new borders. And it says, and Abraham built an altar to the Lord. And he worshipped. And I think at that altar, Abraham had some, I'm sorry, that was not a good move. And I think probably he and Sarah had a conversation, I sure hope so, about I'm sorry. And it's interesting that when you track Abraham's life, that wasn't the end. He made a big mistake. But in chapter 15, God actually renews that great covenant. And God fulfills his promises, even though he made a major, major, significant, nearly fatal mistake about where to be and where to go based primarily on economics. And, you know, I'd just like you to know that's how God will treat you. And you don't have to live with regret. You don't have to feel like all is lost. There may be some pain and some consequences. There were for Abraham. But I'll tell you what, his life doesn't end up like this. His life ended like this. And so I think what you need to do is just bow your head. And if that's the case, just say, Lord, I'm sorry. And, you know, whether willfully, consciously, unconsciously, I look back in my life and see that's happened, and I, I want you to not only forgive me, I want a fresh start. I want you to restore me. And I want to be your man or your woman, because who knows how many years you've given me. I just talked to a guy who remarried at 70 and celebrated his 25th anniversary after his first wife died. See, we, you know, your face is telling me, and you're thinking, you know, who wants to get married at 70? Well, he did. But who, he's got a 25-year anniversary. You know what? God wants some of the people to live the 90. He's in good health, sharp as a tack. You know, God, you know, God may have a lot more years for you. Life is short, but who knows? So let's not live in regrets. Let's live about what God will do in the future. Could I ask you just to bow your head, have a good conversation with your Lord? As we wrap up today's program, I realize there's a number of you with lots of issues about lots of relationships. But I want to talk about this issue of work. You know, we talked about how to find God's will. In other words, you get an opportunity for promotion, or maybe it's a different job in a different state or different city. And, and we said, okay, you know, Lord, I'm willing. And you pray, you get in God's word, you get wisdom from good counsel. But here's another question. When do you know it's time to leave? Maybe you don't have another job, but you're in a job and you're saying, you know, even as I'm talking, you know, man, I'm miserable. I hate my job. Uh, I'm not satisfied. Uh, there's no fire. There's no passion. What do you do then? Well, let me share a quick story that might be helpful to you because about five years ago, I left the pastorate full time and came to walk through the Bible as its president and CEO. And the job was cast vision, uh, teach, create resources, and travel all over the world and help pastors and missionaries. And I got to tell you, I loved it. Year number one, year number two, year number three. Year number four, as things begin to grow, uh, I realized that it was more and more taking me out of my teaching, and it was more and more kind of the CEO, the president role. And I'm a pastor at heart. By year number five, I spent an entire 12 months, probably 13, I did not create one brand new teaching course. Now, I taught a bunch. I went all over the world. But I was in 10-hour budget meetings. I was in organizational leadership. And, you know, I had this, this weight of responsibility. You know, at the end of the day, you know, as they say, the buck stops here. And I felt this weight of responsibility. And I remember getting with my grown kids. I have three grown boys and a grown daughter. And we began to talk about life. And I, I asked them some questions and observations. And, you know, once a year I get them all together and we go away somewhere for vacation. And they bring their kids. And I'll never forget one of my sons looking to me and said, Dad, you know something? I said, what? He said, my observation is the way you're doing life now and your job is life draining instead of life giving. 
And it was vacation, and so people sleep in, and, you know, I just wake up early no matter what. And so I had three or four hours every morning with the Lord on vacation, day one, day two, day three. And by about day three, literally, from the scriptures and the Spirit of God and praying, God rebuked me and said, Chip, I made you to teach. And he reminded me of my passion and my vision. And then he said, what, what are you really doing? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm leading this organization. I'm trying to get all these things sort of in line and, you know, the right people on the bus and the right seats and all that stuff I'm reading. And, and he said, well, how's that going? Kind of the Dr. Phil, Holy Spirit. How's that working for you, Chip? Not very good, you know. And he said, well, you know, what, what about the teaching side? Well, I haven't created anything new. But, but how's that going? And I saw what was happening around the world, and I saw what's happening in the, the teaching and the, the radio and iPods and Internet. And I said, well, Lord, you're blessing that. He said, Chip, that's what I made you to do. And I don't know where you're at. You might be in a situation, but I'll tell you what, I had to humble myself. I had to look at my ego and realize that I didn't want to go to a board and say, you know, I don't think I'm best for this, and I think I need to resign. I need to focus on what God made me to do. I mean, you know, and all of us, we want to be that top person, that president. I got promoted out of my competency, and the job changed from teacher and visionary to organizational leader. And, you know, you might be in a situation where everyone thinks what you're doing is great, but it's killing you. Can I tell you something? Listen to God. Humble yourself. Be willing to do whatever. Pray. Get into his word. Get some really wise counsel. And then pull the trigger. You got one life to live. Live it for him and do what you were made to do. You'll never regret it.